<laughs> Thank you. All right. Well, thanks to the New London Garden Club in particular for uh, coming up with this grand idea and, and being patient with me when we decided to move this to a Zoom format. And you all should know I don't even own a cell phone, so for me to be doing Zooms or computers or anything is really rather remarkable. No less remarkable, however, than the return of the cougar to the East. And so we'll be thinking about that subject today. It's not advancing. Ah, uh, no, it's, it's not advancing. Yeah. Maybe I won't do that. Yeah. I won't. I won't. I won't. Yeah. Good. Okay. So this has been presented by Keeping Track in, in collaboration with Northeast Wilderness Trust. Is that a cutie or what? And generous support for this program that has uh, helped us uh, make this affordable, uh, not just to the Garden Club, but to other organizations throughout the Northeast is the Larson Fund. We're most grateful to them. Well, these pictures you're going to see today are all my own pictures unless otherwise indicated. And we're, we're going to be focusing on the cougar and the cougar returning to the east, but not without thinking about how to tell the difference between the cougar and some of its cousins that do live here in the Northeast. These are people who have helped with the uh, formatting and indexing and cataloging of my images, so thanks to them. And thanks to uh, Bobby Summers, who alas passed away this fall. Uh, she was invaluable to keeping track as we prepared these programs for, for uh, PowerPoint presentation. So, this is quite the critter, and I will say that in my professional work as a biologist for now more than 40 years, there is no other animal that captures the imagination of Americans quite like the cougar. And I've given lectures on all of them, and even wolves, uh, they're, they're just not quite as fascinating to people for some reason. And so. I'm sure you are all here today because of that. What about their return here? We'll certainly learn about that. Uh, this program will not give you specifics about where cougar sightings have occurred in and around your towns or regions. That's not the purpose. The purpose of this program will be to think about why cougars are important. And before I go on, let me just ask you all to repeat after me. Cougar? Mountain lion, panther, painter, puma, catamount, they're all names for the same animal. Where I was doing research with cougars in Utah, some of the houndsmen I worked with them referred to them as deer slain sombitch. They are remarkably Beautiful, athletic, strong. They're considered to be the strongest pound for pound cat of any cat in the world, including the Bengal tiger. So pound for pound, the cougar is number uno. And by the way, if I flip around from cougar to puma to panther, it's because I'm talking about different parts of the range of the animal that I have studied all over North America. Their young really face a very scary prospect of reaching adulthood and getting to become reproducing animals in their own right. It's a dangerous world out there. And I will say the chief number one danger for them is us. Us, our hunting, our poaching, our cars, our poisons, all of this. Central to the subject at hand today, which is why I'm so proud to be uh, partnering with Northeast Wilderness Trust in this, is the understanding that wild habitats, big, unfragmented, 
core habitats, we call them, linked together with corridors uh, or linkage habitats, depending on which you're talking about, are key to the success of life on Earth. Wherever you are, this is the formula for life in the future. And we need to be mindful of that because we're losing it at a horrific rate. This picture taken where I live is land that I have conserved permanently with the Northeast Wilderness Trust. I own the valley below where this gentleman is standing, all babysitter swamp. And I'm so proud to have put aside for the future wildlife now and forever, that wonderful habitat. It's full of wetlands, secret places, it's not full of cougars yet. I have to say, in all my years of tracking cougars, I have never found a cougar track or sign anywhere here in the Northeast. I expect to someday. And I'm not saying that they haven't passed through. I know better. They definitely have. We'll talk more about that later. But they're, they're secretive animals. This is what they do. When they're visible, they're magnificent. They're incredibly strong and capable predators, and important predators at that. They're what we call keystone predators. If you think of the keystone in the architectural integrity of an arch, the cougar and the wolf and the grizzly bear and the big predators, the apex predators as we call them, they are the keystones. They help that arch stay together and function as a whole. We'll talk about the tra tracks and sign of cougars today. I know many of you are interested in this and maybe many of you have seen tracks that you suspect are made by cougars. This is a tom. This is a male cougar and you can tell him because he's got a big, I call it basketball head, big round massive skull. He's very different from his female counterparts. He might weigh what a human male might weigh, anywhere from 125 pounds for a very small individual to as much as 200 or more for a big cougar. Females, on the other hand, are sleek and their faces are somewhat more pointed and less round. No, no basketball heads here. So what do you think? Tom or female? That's decidedly a tom. Where toms and females cohabit a habitat, well, of course, they're kittens. And kittens are born spotted like this. It's cryptic coloration. It allows them to blend in with their environment, which is often dappled with mixed lighting and different colored objects, rocks and leaves. And mother, when she leaves after nursing them, she may need, she may need to be gone for hours, if not the whole night while she's hunting, so that she can lactate and support them. So they need to be hidden. Later on, those spots will sort of fade, and I call them shadows of spots. So we'll see splotches of grayness throughout the coat and on the flanks. Later on, they lose those spots and they begin to look more like small versions of adults. Here they're acting like all cats that are full of it, having a ball, playing, they're amazing athletes. I personally saw this cougar jump from one rock to another, a distance of not quite 40 feet. Amazing. They're very capable runners and they can be very fast. So don't plan on running away from a cougar, that won't work. But they're really not hardwired to be running after their prey. They're hidden, they're silent, they're sneaking, they're stalking, they get close. Unlike wolves, they're not chasing their prey. They use their tail for counterbalance, so they can negotiate some very impossible circumstances. And it's thought that one of the reasons why cougars were not totally extirpated in the most rugged fastnesses of the American West was because a lot of that terrain is very rugged and rocky and steep and inaccessible. And uh, cougars are good at that. 
If you think you're seeing a cougar, look for that tail. That's unmistakably a cougar's tail. It's thick, massive, it swings around as the animal moves from left to right. And it's a big part of what cougars are all about. And cougars that are not captive individuals living in situations where they can't be properly exercised, they're muscular like this. Thick arms, thick haunches. They like that rugged terrain. Now, this is a lynx. And in our region, uh, this animal, we didn't even know we had lynx as residents anywhere here in northern New England 35 years ago, but lo and behold, we do. And that's why wilderness is important, because we need to secure the wild habitats with outgrowths and developments and, and uh, even tremendous amounts of recreation so that these wild animals can move about the larger landscape and get here for example, from Canada. But this is the Canada lynx. And one thing you'll want to notice is that black tip tail. Look at this. I'm just going to, the black tip tail, that's the lynx. Later on, you'll see why that's important. But here the lynx, we have something that's very unusual. I call them bedroom slippers for feet. Their feet are enormous, proportionately much bigger than cougars or bobcats to their body size, those huge feet, especially the huge hind feet, allow them to chase their principal prey, the snowshoe hare. They're animals of the boreal forest and the more cold uh, regions of our hemisphere. Uh, we would not expect to see them in Pennsylvania, or uh, certainly not today anyway, uh, or Florida or Delaware, but up in Maine and northern New Hampshire and northern Vermont and certainly up into Canada, all the way across to the Yukon. Notice those really long black tipped ears. That's the trademark of the cougar. No other cat here in our country has ears like that. This is what they're after. They have snowshoe hair for breakfast, snowshoe hair for lunch, snowshoe hair for dinner. It's kind of boring. But that's what they're about. Cougars, on the other hand, eat everything, literally everything, from small rodents to elk and moose. So here is a skeleton mount that I made of a Canada lynx skeleton, which is the bigger one, and a snowshoe pair running beside it. And you can see the body plan is basically the same. Great big hind feet, bigger than front feet, a long, lean, featherweight body. Um, you know, the skulls, of course, are very different, but boy, a form follows function, or you are what you eat. So I was there in Maine when lynx were first really officially recognized as, in fact, living in Maine and breeding in Maine and having young in Maine. It was very exciting. And these are lynx kittens that we got to look at. So again, the trademarks, long ear tufts, a black tip tail, and then here's something from the hock all the way down to the bottom of the foot. Links, the coat will be the color of the body. It'll be tan or grayish tan or bluish grayish tan. Uh, bobcats will be dark brown or black. There's your bobcat. So from the hock down to the bottom of the foot, uh, the color is dark brown or black. And the tail is not a solid black tip tail. In fact, there's a lot of white underneath the tail. This is a bobcat. Bobcats uh, have that very distinctive tail that's different than the lynx. And people expect to see that bobcats are a lot more spotted and barred with stripes and bars. And that's true in some locations, but not so true here in the Northeast. Our bobcats can be fairly uh, unspotted looking for the most part, except for the legs and the belly region. So quiz, lynx, would you agree? Lynx, bobcat, notice how tiny those ear tufts are. That will surprise people. Sometimes bobcat ear tufts hardly show at all. 
What do you think? Wildcat. Links. It's important that we know these things because there's a lot of mistaken identities out there. And again, in my career doing this sort of thing for a living, I've had hundreds of photographs and or reports sent to me of uh, alleged cougars that turned out to be bobcats. And that's not to ridicule anyone. And they're easy to be confused sometimes, especially in certain lighting. This is a bobcat. Links. So cougars, along with their cousins, the bobcats and the lynxes, are what I call cryptic. They're hidden. They're about concealment. They're about stalking and getting close to prey. They are not what we call cursorial. They're not chasing their prey. Not for any great distance, anyway. They use cover, concealment. They rely upon that. So one attribute of lynx and cougar and uh, bobcat habitat where we live will be that, will be the cover, the natural cover of our forest, involving all the layers of vegetation from the forest floor all the way up into the canopies of the trees. This bobcat is stalking what it thinks is a turkey. <laughs> That's me. And so it'll leave that cover as it makes that last leap between where it's hiding and hopefully dinner. This cougar, I was radio tracking this cougar in Alberta and I didn't even see her, but I had a sixth sense, a prickly feeling in the back of my neck. And I looked up and the only thing moving was her tail. Everything else was still, still, still. If it hadn't been for her tail, I wouldn't have seen her. She meant me no harm. As soon as our eyes met, she turned tail and walked away. Cats are about concealment, stalking. This is my Alistair of Jericho, <laughs> my portable puma. He thinks he's hiding. <laughs> so really, those of us who love cougars, I think, love cougars because, gee whiz, they really are cats. And there's just certain behaviors of cats, certain habits of cats that are very endearing to those of us who love them. But many fear them, you see, because our increasing suburban sprawl in habitats that once belonged to cougars, for example, in this place uh, out west in Wyoming, uh, all these condos and these villages of houses in the mountains named after the canyons that are now gone. Um, they attract deer, for heaven's sakes, especially during these periods of extreme drought and fire. Deer aren't stupid. They're not going to stay up in the mountains and starve. They're going to come down to town. And so when they come down to town, cougars sometimes are not far behind. And that frightens people. But you should know that the official average of fatalities associated with pumas is about a half a person a year. Non-fatal encounters, it, the, the number goes up to about two encounters a year. Way more people, thousands of people are killed in cars because of deer, collisions, killed by domestic dogs, spider bites, lightning strikes, so really, we're talking about a risk factor that barely exists statistically. But, you know, you're at a picnic and your wife says to you, honey, what is that? What, dear? Well, that is sort of lying in the grass. I thought I saw it move a minute ago. <sighs> a fearful prospect. Well, let me tell you, if you have a scene like this while you're picnicking, do not run. Do not squeal or squeak or in any way sound like a prey animal. Hold your ground, stand up, get your entire family on your feet, look larger than life. If there's stones around, pelt them at the cat because they are scaredy cats and they will run away. They're hardwired to kill and eat deer-like prey, whether they be wanakos in 
Patagonia or or moose calves in uh, the Yukon, they're after deer-like prey. Does that mean every deer in the woods is going to get eaten by a cougar? Absolutely not. And by the way, I'm a deer hunter myself, so I don't wake up in the morning hating cougars because they're going to take away my deer. I know better. I've been in the wildest country in North America with deer and cougars, and they are healthier because of the cougars. We'll talk about that in a minute. And don't think for a minute that most of them that survive predation aren't good at it. They hear, they smell, they see, they especially smell, oh boy. Apex predators are essential for their well-being though, because the presence of predators causes them to change their feeding habits. And they're less likely to loll around on the open pastures like they used to do in Yellowstone when I first started going there before the wolves were restored and before the cougar numbers really grew. And the elk were way overpopulated and were damaging their habitat. And so the fear they feel causes them to shift their locations and uses of habitats and give portions of their habitats a break. And that causes biodiversity to get a break in turn. There's less over-browsing. And other animals get a break as a result of predators. Predators, the remains of predator kills are essential for the well-being of all sorts of animals from chickadees to wolverine. They all eat what's left over. It's actually been figured out, I don't know who did this or how, it's actually been figured out that the most biodiversity in the world is associated with cougar kills. Go figure. I love the word. If I didn't say that, that is a word in Alaska. So we have a real long, not love affair, but hate affair with predators, spanning decades, all through the 20th century, and for that matter, the latter 19th century. Countless millions of these animals were destroyed by us because we hated them. There was a, a roundup done in Pennsylvania where one guy, not this man, but Black Jack Schwartz, uh, and uh, roughly a hundred other people with torches and guns and, exploding devices and whistles and God knows what else, hazed all the wildlife in towards the center where they shot them. They killed over a thousand animals, 41 of which were panthers, pumas, cougars, all names for the same animal. What we need to do today, those of us who love wildlife and and for that matter, love healthy ecosystems uh, that wildlife depend upon, and certainly in the case of predators, help manage, if you will. Uh, we need to remind ourselves that they're beings like ourselves, and they have feelings, and they have families, and they feel love for their offspring. For example, this is a father coyote getting ready to regurgitate for his youngster. I call it the hot lunch program. We love our deer, don't we? And some of us who hunt deer once a year love that venison, don't we? But does that really give us the right to destroy all kinds of other animals because they're somehow uh, a hazard to deer? I don't think so. And deer, as Aldo Leopold pointed out in his essay, Thinking Like a Mountain, uh, which was included in a Sam County Almanac. When you have browsing like this, whether it's deer or in this case, moose in Northern Maine, it's nuts, it's off the charts. It's a disaster for all manner of wildlife, not to mention the balsam fir that are over browsed here. That's a browse line caused by moose in Maine. There are too many moose in Maine. Now moose numbers are declining because of winter tech, but this is not healthy. Too much. 
ask yourself, where would you be if you had to find shelter in all that woods that's now been denuded of its vegetation, all by moose? And of course, the moose themselves struggle in the end. They starve, their calves starve, especially if they're simultaneously afflicted with other problems, which was the case for this cat. She had over 40,000 winter ticks on her. But mind you, she didn't die because of the tick. She died of malnutrition. The ticks are a problem, no doubt about it. But not being able to reach adequate food or, or secure enough of it after the hardships of the rut, which is in the case of this bull elk, that's, that's a disaster. You're not going to get to the end of winter. You won't make it. And mercifully, predators will make use of you. That's the way the world goes around. So cougars returning to the east will be the best thing that happens to our forests. And you gardeners in the New London Garden Club uh, appreciate tending your gardens and caring for the well-being of the community of plants that you nurture. Well, cougars do that. And that's what we need because we have too many deer in many places in our region, way too many. Research done in Connecticut uh, sought to germinate deer pellets and they grew 57 species of plant from the seeds within those deer scats. 32 of those plants that grew were invasive species. So there's a direct cause and effect relationship we're finding between too many deer and the spread of invasive species. Now, let's get into some of the exciting news about recovery in the East. Well, I'm sad to say it's not recovery because none of these animals necessarily have lived. We don't know what happened to this particular female. She was an unusual uh, cat, colonizer female, I call her, that came all the way from South Dakota to Humphreys County, Tennessee, where she was filmed. Uh, I think she was eventually killed. And this is a map that shows us the Eastern Range expansion and the actual presence of science-confirmed uh, sightings and or evidence, or in some cases, actual animals that really are, are showing up like a measles map in the middle of our country. Well, that was then. I'm sad to say today, this is nowhere near the case. Today, the killing sprees in the Rocky Mountains and in particular in places like uh, South Dakota, to some degree, North Dakota, Wyoming, too many cougars are being killed at the source. So their transient young aren't taking the journeys that they used to take. And hence, the likelihood of them getting here is even slimmer. This is the journey taken by one cat over 2,000 miles from Black Hills uh, all the way to Connecticut, where it was eventually killed. Uh, we don't know where the cougar went after it left the Lake George region, where it was positively seen and identified. And by the way, uh, collections of scat and hair uh, and urine, in one case that I know about, uh, all added up genetically, looking at the genetic fingerprint, will you, if you will, of this one individual, referred to as the Connecticut cat. That's quite the journey. That's the longest journey that we're aware of. Here's something I'd like to share with you. If you've been told that you haven't seen a cougar, you couldn't possibly see a cougar, they aren't here, and you are just out of your mind, feel better about this, because that cat went from Lake George all the way to Connecticut. It obviously had been seen by many people many of whom were probably not taken seriously. You see where I'm going? And here's something else that will make us feel good. In terms of total forest cover, especially contiguous forest cover, which is what we have in the Northeast, we have more than any place out West. 
So if you're looking for cougar habitat, we have it right here. There's no question about it. Now, here's the lie about it all. How many of us believe that the iconic African lion is protected and its populations are stable and, and doing okay? And the answer is no. From an estimated 450,000 lions in the mid 20th century to now perhaps fewer than 20,000 animals, the African lion is in a free fall. And hunting is no solution. Hunting is being touted as a way we can commodify the African lion and build support among native peoples for the African lion and lion hunting. And that is a disaster. In the case of the cougar, it turns out there's some real similarities. Hunting cougars in the United States does two things. It compromises natural dispersal and recolonization success, and it prevents important opportunities for ecosystem repair. Every time you kill the dominant male, not unlike the African lion male, cohort in a pride, perhaps a couple of individuals, in the words of, of uh, the scientist, three juvenile delinquents show up for the funeral. With the grown-ups gone, the young hooligans run wild. Well, what he's trying to say here is when we kill the resident Tom for as a trophy uh, in the United States, uh, we introduce into his vacancy a uh, young Toms. The first thing they do is they kill the kittens that were sired by that Tom and they cause all kinds of social upheaval in that population. 75% of all females in a population are either pregnant or caring for their young. So if kittens are being killed uh, because, because young toms are coming in and killing them, that's one thing. I don't know that anybody's measuring that really, but something else is going on, 75% are either pregnant or caring for their young. So what happens when we turn to killing females, which they're doing in South Dakota now, because there aren't enough toms to go around? We're not just putting one head on the wall, we could be putting five. Who's doing the math? So some of us are concerned that cougar numbers are declining, not growing, and that our opportunities for recovery here in the East are not increasing, but probably decreasing. The only way we can do that, fix that, is to stop the hunting, or at least regulate it severely. Where will they go? Their mother's not coming back. Who will feed them? They stay with their mothers for up to 18 months learning how to be cougars. How will they learn? So the famous now famous, he's recently passed away, alas, John Landre, who was a friend, uh, he referred to cougars as guardians of the ecosystem. They're shepherds of the ecosystem by moving their prey species around in an ecology of fear, they are supporting biodiversity. But what about us? What are we doing? Well, this is what we're doing. We're messing it up every time you turn around. By the way, you can get a rustic ranch internet connection there. Now that's worth it, huh? Everywhere I go, it's the same. I'm not going to just pick on America. It's everywhere. And this was decreed by the state of Wyoming as critical, the capital C, wildlife habitat for elk, I mean, excuse me, for mule deer and pronghorn in Wyoming, this is called the uh, Pine Dale Anticline. Today it is filled with hundreds of fracking pads. Money talks, nobody walks. 
And this is what you see where, when you're on the ground there. Every one of those fracking pads is a road that's driven, driven every day by somebody who's got to check it. Where do the deer and pronghorn fit in? So we're a menace, and it's been going on for a long time. And of course, the cougar, in this case, the panther of Florida, is really at risk. We almost blew it in Florida. We almost caused the extinction of that animal. Fortunately, uh, a real strong coalition of environmental groups, including the Defenders of Wildlife, Nature Conservancy, and others, Friends of the Florida Panther, in collaboration with the Florida Agency uh, Fish and Wildlife, they worked together in the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, too. This became the state animal of Florida, and children rallied for the success of the panther. More money was spent per capita in Florida on habitat and conservation when this was going on, and it, it had a positive result. The roads continue to be a menace. Way too many animals are killed by cars. We've got to stop building roads in panther habitat, and we've got to slow people down. And that's true right here in New England, where I took this picture. When we cut off their habitat with roads and human developments, we often limit them for where they can feed and have access to secure habitats in which to be safe. If it's a hard winter, they go to sleep and they don't wake up. When I was studying cougars out west, I, I quickly appreciated why they survived Unlike the wolves and so many other animals, they were just too impossible to get. Look at that country. All the way you can get around that country is ride a mule. Not even a horse can do that country. And so everywhere I was privileged to get a glimpse of all this work going on, I was impressed with the land, impressed with its wildness. No roads here. No developments here. None at all. How did we catch cougars anyway? Well, we did. These guys did. They were the professors of catching cougars. This is Dart. <laughs> he knew how to catch cougars. And this is Donnie, and she's barking tree, which is our way of saying, it's up this tree, it's up this tree, it's up this tree, you humans, hurry up. Arr, 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 arr. Oh, the cougar's having a bad day. Not good. They're scared of dogs. A Pomeranian can tree a cougar. So uh, we did all that. We learned a lot, still are. I'm not doing it anymore, but biologists are still collaring animals. They're using GPS collars now to do some pretty remarkable things. But it's hard on them, and I, I will be the first person to admit it. I prefer tracking. That's why I started keeping track. I think we can learn an awful lot of this stuff without messing with these animals. They look relaxed, don't they? Tree up there, the dogs barking below. Oh, really relaxed. Actually, they're super stressed is what they are. What do they eat? Well, we learned that. We learned that they eat mule deer, well, those big ears, elk. Sometimes bighorn, that gets them into trouble some places. Beaver. It will surprise you to know that a key prey animal for cougars everywhere they exist is beaver and would have been the case here. And they are an important regulator, if you will, of beaver numbers. Porcupines, same thing. Wherever cougars and porcupines coexist, Porcupines are on the menu. The Florida panther is known to eat things like armadillos and uh, hawks, wild hawks, possum. They eat raccoons, which is sad. For lack of sufficient other prey, they sometimes turn to eating raccoons, which gets them into trouble with the biomagnification of toxins, including mercury. And of course, they eat deer. 
They're very capable swimmers. They're beautiful animals. They're very sleek looking compared to cougars or mountain lions of the west or the north. Their coat is shorter, velvet-like. And when I first saw this place, I had to shake my head. I just, this did not add up to what I thought I knew about cougar habitat. But this is in Big Cypress. Great cougar habitat. However, they want to drill this place for oil. So if you folks want to help cougars and panthers, get on, look up Earth Justice, look up Natural Resources Defense Council, and learn about the push to drill for oil and build roads and infrastructure in Big Cypress. Panther habitat. You can't do that. You shouldn't do that. On the upland domes, which might only feature an elevational rise of a few feet, uh, you start picking up hardwoods, oaks, pines. And this is where the deer really flourish and the hogs. And yeah, the panthers know that. The panthers will den and have their kittens in these thick saw palmetto habitats where, where it's just an impenetrable jungle of vegetation. It's awfully noisy if you try and sneak up on them through that. And they know that. The Florida Panther was about ready to blink out years ago, not that many years ago, actually, 40 years ago. And they realized that they were genetically, they were inbred for lack of connectivity with cougars from the West, the way it used to be from Texas across the Southeast into Florida. That was all gone. Habitat fragmentation caused that isolated population of panthers to be inbred. And that manifested itself in the form of birth defects, heart murmurs, reduced sperm motility, uh, and uh, increased rates of infectious disease. So kittens would rarely even get to grow up. They introduced into Florida some live captured females from, uh, from Texas and released them in Florida, let them be bred by Florida panther males and overnight the genetic bottlenecking pretty much disappeared. Mm -hmm. Pretty amazing. So the population has definitely grown a lot since then, but I'll, I'll, I'll say again, it's largely due to the support of people like you and me and the organizations I mentioned earlier and the presence of wildlands that are secure. Okay, let's do a little tracking. These are cougar feet from a road-killed cougar. Uh, the front foot on the left, the hind foot on the right. And um, right away you see uh, the top toe. Well, if you take your hand and your right hand and get rid of your thumb and just look at your four toes, the middle finger is the one that's the longest and it is the highest on the foot. Do you all see that? And the little finger, if you wiggle it, is the smallest and it's on the outside. So we're looking at a left front foot there and a left hind foot. So do you all see that? This is a bobcat, same thing. The other things that cats have is, I call it M for meow. They, uh, I'm going to do this. See, the top of the palm pad has an M shape, M for meow. Dogs don't have that. So what foot would that be? If I told you that was a front foot and you flipped it over, you see where the middle toe is and where the little toe is, what would that be? Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now this is a house cat track. That's my Alistair of Jericho. And he has the same thing. He has the, he has the leading toe and the little toe, and he has the M for meow, and you see that there's a quarter there. So if it's about the size of a quarter, it's a house cat. Yeah, this is a really big house cat. But one thing that cats have in snow or soft sand with a firm top is what I call a hair halo. They have the edge of fur that encircles the track impression. The house cat 
M for meow. That is a big bobcat. See how much bigger that is? That'd be about the size of a golf ball. And you can see the hair halo. There's a bobcat track in Arizona, and there's a little Great Basin Spadefoot toad in the middle of the palm pad impression. <laughs> that is a Tom Cougar track next to my boot. Notice how much bigger that is. That would be about the size of a softball. Much bigger. Look at the M, M for me out. Dogs don't have that. They have two, two uh, toes that are even with one another and are, go straight across. And these two toes are even with one another. I prefer a regular laser. And then the palm pad comes to a point, like the pointed muzzle of a dog. So there's no M there. The result is you can draw an X through a dog track. See that X? It's perfect. You can draw an X through that track without intersecting any of the tag features. What about that? That's a cat track. In this case, a Florida panther. It's the left front foot. No X there. No X there. Oh, why is this? Oh, yeah, and there's the hair halo. Bobcat. No X. Hair halo. Lynx is different. And uh, real quick, just to wind up the tracking section here, Lynx have tiny little toes and a tiny little pad, and fur fills up the whole middle part of the track. We call that negative space. So the track should look like the foot with a lot of negative space. All that middle space is fur. Uh, why is this? Okay. The canis, we'll see the X, that's a coyote. Uh, why is this doing this? Are you okay? So these are cougar tracks, in this case, Florida Panther. And if you're out there and you're taking pictures of tracks that you want to show to authorities, try to put something really familiar next to the track for a source of scale, or better yet, a ruler. This is my biggest wolf track in northern Montana. Look at that X. Florida panther tracks filled with rainwater. Okay, now you tell me, is a cat or a dog? Well, you kind of have a leading toe, and you might have a little toe. You might have an M for meow on that, although it's hard to be sure. This is the way tracks really are, by the way. It's usually hard to be sure. Gather all the evidence. Notice the tennis ball. Is there dog slobber on the tennis ball? Yes, indeed, there is. That's my neighbor's golden retriever. Okay, this is my area of research, and this certainly helps us zero in on how we're going to get positive identifications of cougars in our woods. Because this is something they all do, and the evidence is lasting. It's much, much more enduring say, for example, than a track. Scent marking is simply the communication that these animals do. No two animals are the same, no two animals have the same scent signature, and no two animals, uh, therefore, are, are um, the same. This is the lynx. He's Fleeman. He's taking the scent that he's just smelled from a female's track or her urine or something, and he's checking it out. You see horses do it, deer do it. They take the scent up to uh, an organ in the palate that helps them transfer the scent molecules to the brain center where the information uh, influences, in this case, their sexual libido. Oh, 
they, my, my experience is that cougars like to facial mark conifers. Uh, they don't spray like bobcats, but they do a lot of facial marking. And there's glands around the lips and glands on the forehead. So when they do that, they're leaving scent. <sighs> Wonderful. It's that time of year. <sighs> so the subtlest things go on out there. We miss it all because we don't smell these things. They can taste the scent. They get those scent molecules up to the palate where it can be processed. Now, are we going to see that? Not necessarily, but if we have tracks in the snow that lead to places like this, and we see tracks standing there, we might expect that. If it's a case of a bobcat, we might look for where it's sprayed there. In the case of a cougar, we might look for what we call a scrape there. We will find this. It's not terribly common, but it's common enough. Just like our house cats, they take their claws and they rake the surfaces of trees and logs to create a substrate that absorbs their scent. There's glands between the toes called interdigital glands, and they're leaving a scent message. It's called claw raking. They all do it. Your house cat does it. They're programmed to do it right from the get-go. As kittens, they start doing it. So they break the log and they, their scent from between the toes gets left there. Alistair knows about this. You see, he's a cat. Now you'll notice this boot is changing over time. He's a dedicated scent marker in my environment. Notice he's sniff checked. And this is the final result. <laughs> I've retired these boots. So when I have found cougar claw raking, it's, it's usually in association with, with a kill site or a den site or someplace where they're stationary for a period of time. And the claw raking is their way of marking. Now this is probably the most important thing we can learn today, the scrape. The scrape is ubiquitous in cougar country. And as you see here, bobcat country. They take their front feet, they plant them, they bring their hind feet up behind their front feet and they scratch back first one, then the other. And they make a parallel scraping of the two feet that looks like a long trench that culminates in a little pile. They will sometimes defecate on that pile, and that's what you see there, you see the feces. But always there's scent there because glands between the toes leave scent just simply for having made the scrape. Notice how the front feet were stationary, they're not moving a bit. Cougars do this all the time. Okay. So that's the cougar scrape. And if you find one of these, do whatever you can to make sure you take that picture so you can have a sense for just what size you're looking at. Because a bobcat scrape and a cougar scrape look the same, except one is bigger than the other. Oh, she, you recognize her tapered head, is smelling the pine needles that he made into a scrape for her. And he is smelling the leaves that she made to scrape. There's a lot going on here. That's a Tom Cougar scrape. Notice my hat, notice the pen. I was invited by these biologists to help them prove that jaguars were living in Arizona. And this was several years ago before there was any official recognition that there were jaguars there. And so I used scent marking to get at that. And I found a place where a jaguar, the one that they kept getting these wonderful pictures of with their remote cameras, I found where this animal, Macho B, was claw raking a mesquite tree in a wash. I said, put your camera right here. And so that's what they did. And here's what they got. A month later, there's Macho B claw raking the same tree. 
And I've done this now for over 20 years with remote cameras at Wolf Front, monitoring bobcat set marking. And these are different cats over time, all marking in the same location. Here's one making a scrape. Here's one facial marking. Here's, uh, it's just finished doing some facial marking. So it's really kind of remarkable. And so if we find, and here's a female, she's in heat, she's rolling around, she's acting, well, you know, like she needs and wants him right away. Notice her face. <laughs> so if you find these places, it's like finding a book with a whole story all spelled out for you. Here she is. She's out of there. We find that there are concentrated places where scent marking occurs again and again, where they travel through the country. And in cliffy terrain, such as where bobcats like to live here in Northern New England, um, places where they negotiate the most precarious little ways up and down the cliff surface will often be scent marked. And that's what allowed me to get this picture of mama bobcat with her kitten. Oh, what's going on? She's approaching the camera. Looks like a cougar, but it's not. It's her. Yeah, it's, it's a bobcat. Unusual with those rounded ears. What? What is she doing? She's facial marking my camera. She's rubbing her face on the camera. There's her ear. There's her eye in the lower left hand corner. This is something else that's very important. If cougars live where we live, we will find evidence of them eating. And because they are inclined to take deer and sometimes even moose calves, there'll be food left over. And they are hardwired with leftover food to, uh, to cover it. And that's to prevent its detection from ravens or by ravens that would blab about it and tell everybody else in the woods and the poor cougars would lose their hard-won meal. So caching is an important behavior, and bobcats do it too. Cougars really do this. They're hardwired to drag that deer in undercover to prevent its detection by other predators or scavengers. Here's a, a drag mark of where a cougar dragged a javelina and buried it. You see that mound underneath the, next to my backpack, there's a mound buried in the sand underneath that mesquite tree. It was the only tree in the watch. They have uh, dermal dentisols on their tongues that allow them to rasp meat off of the bones. They're not like wolverines and even wolves. They do not crush bones. They they can crush and feather the lower bones, but uh, you know the great big leg bones and so on will be intact. And the kill will be intact. It's not torn apart the way the dogs do. It's often a very peaceful affair. They'll often lie down. If there's snow on the ground, you'll find an iced over bed next to, next to the meal. Dogs, on the other hand, are with one another. There's arguments going on. Me first, you later, get away, this is mine. And so there's tracks all over the place. It's a very messy scene. So to end this show, it's about romance. It's about partners. You see the Tom, you see the female, right? Oh, isn't that sweet? Now she's leaving, he's frustrated, he can't keep up. He wants to get together with her, but she's being difficult. Maybe if I give her the cold shoulder, she'll want me more. Notice she's lying there. She really would like to hook up with him, but something in her can't quite do it just yet. Not just me. Look at the look in his face. If you keep pushing me, Buster, I'm going to take your basketball head and dribble it down the court. <laughs> you 
You see a change of mood here, though, ever so slightly. See the difference? Uh, you see that? She's she's ready now. She's uh. Where you have lovemaking, you have families. Where you have families, you have populations. And this goes for all of our wildlife. And the animals that we may take for granted today, not that any of us would do such a thing, they're no less at risk. We're all at risk, ourselves included. We have got to change our ways. And the good way to start is to start by loving everything around us, including our gardens. Ironically, what animals need now more than ever before is people. Oh my God, what a concept. But they do, they need us. They need us. We need to get busy. We need to champion the animals we love and really mean it. The past, the present, the future, it's all here, but we have to secure the habitat. And that's why the work we do is so important now more than ever. I'm going to conclude by uh, sharing some lines from a book called Incident at Eagle Ranch by Donald Schuller. He's talking about the mountain lion here. He said, the mountain lion works a strong magic in the imagination of most Americans. It is the ultimate loner, a renegade presence in the wildest mountains, and wildest canyons, the sign of everything that is remote from us, everything we have not spoiled. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sue. So how do I do it? I was thinking maybe we could do the Q and A right here. Sure. Easier. Okay, great. Well, I want to say a big thank you to you, Sue. I know that everybody on the other side of the screen can't voice, but I'm sure there's applause on the other side of the screen. So we really appreciate your presentation. I learned so much that I didn't know before. And so we have time for just a couple questions. And we'll kick off with the first. Um, so people helping out cougars, what would you name as the top ways that people can get involved to help out these beautiful animals? Well, there's two ways. Certainly at the source in Western habitats, there are organizations like the Mountain Lion Foundation and the Cougar Fund in particular, those two that are really looking at uh, constantly monitoring our inappropriate hunting and management uh, mistakes that we're making and, and, and uh, other organizations that are looking bigger scale, landscape scale at, at habitat conservation are the Wildlands Network, um, uh, Earth Justice does a great job with legal, legal work, uh, Natural Resources Defense Council, these are all organizations I belong to and believe in and uh, you know, there are others, but, but I think locally, start at home. Tend your gardens, you know, all of you out there from the Garden Club, you know how beautiful beauty is, but it's got to go beyond that. And do so without pesticides. <laughs> you know, and then all in all, there's a million things we can do every day that, uh, you know, offer some relief, I think. Wonderful. We had a couple other questions from audience members. Um, one person asked about a kill site in the backyard that they saw a couple winters ago. There was, um, they had a young deer and there was a impression of a deer and the fur, just the fur less behind. And they heard that it, from somebody else that it was probably a bobcat. Do you think that that would be the case or what does that sound like? Well, Impression of just the fur in the background. Of course, any kill today is quickly eaten by many things after mm -hmm. the fact. So, 
it's sort of hard to sort out the evidence very long after the killing occurred. Mm -hmm. um, the young deer that's apt to just totally disappear would be coyotes mm -hmm. because they eat everything, mm -hmm. all the bones, because they take it away, they tear it apart, it goes, it goes throughout the forest, some of it gets cached, mm -hmm. you know, and the only thing that's left is the head. Okay, pretty much. Cats, um, you'll see uh, the larger bones of the carcass that are still there, and mm -hmm. until something else comes along and takes those bones away, that's what you're out to see with cats. Um, Cats, the whole kill stays in place. It does not get torn apart and scattered mm -hmm. in, in other directions the way dogs and bears do. Okay. So uh, those would be a couple of things I've looked for. And there is one major oversight that I've made in, in terms of organizations to belong to right here in the East, obviously, Northeast <laughs> Wilderness Trust, because we have so well, you tell us, I mean, how much wilderness we really have? Oh, so that's a great point. Yeah, yeah. so um, right now, I think it's about 3% of the Northeast that's protected as wilderness, and we need a lot more. Uh, experts are saying we need a lot more, and that's what we're here to do, is make that number much higher than 3%. Um, and something like, the, something like a quarter of the Northeast is protected in general, which includes farms and work, uh, timberlands, but only 3% of the Northeast is wildland. So there's a big disproportion there. And the thing that I keep coming back to with that is for all of our best intentions, for every other kind of designation out there for lands, whether they're land trust lands or critical habitat, that could change tomorrow, mm -hmm. but wilderness can't. Mm -hmm. I mean, as long as our legal systems work and our society works at all, mm -hmm. wilderness is permanent. I like, I like that. that. Yes. I like that. Yeah. Because I've seen too much change mm -hmm. wherever I go. The yeah. wildest places in the art, you know, here today, gone tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. So. Absolutely. Well, I'm just going to look at that point. <laughs> um, we had another question about the location of, of, of where you studied cougars and taken images who would like to share like, the, the range of places that you've been doing this research. Well, research in some cases is, is, is being generous because <laughs> really I'm a guest of existing research projects. I am not a cougar biologist per se, although I am very knowledgeable about aspects of cougar behavior, maybe more knowledgeable about scent marking than anybody, but I'm not putting radio collars on animals myself. So I've been a guest of projects in places like the Sheep River Drainage in, in Alberta. I, I've, uh, I co directed a mountain lion uh, track count research project on the Arizona Mexico border. Mm -hmm. um, I've done a lot of work in Wyoming and um, Utah. Mm -hmm. um, those would be the key places. I was a guest in California very briefly looking at the urban cougar situation with Cold Canyon and the Santa Ana Mountains and, you know, living in a very, very suburbanized world where they actually, again, thanks to people, preserved Cold Canyon. People did that. People made that happen. One woman in particular was right on it. And they raised $50 million, but it was worth it. And everybody today... Is, it's a real landmark. Wow. So that's I think like, that sounds like a great success story. It's a great success story. Yes. That, that brings up another question, which is um, what are your thoughts on successful cougar reintroduction and, and getting more people on board with it and that kind of public messaging? I, I think, given our experience in Yellowstone and the, and the you know, controversy associated with the wolf restoration, which, by the way, was already happening on its own. Those of us who are professional trackers who are knowledgeable that cougars had already crossed the Canadian border in Montana with or without their visa cards. Mm -hmm. We knew that. So it was only a matter of time before the whole Yellowstone ecosystem would, would be there for them. Um, that said, since then, wolves have recovered themselves in Washington State and Oregon and more recently, you know, Arizona, they're in there, California. It's, it's really amazing. So cougars are different because their their means of getting their dispersers mm -hmm. that distance all the way from the Rockies to here, or even from 
closer in places to here is so great that uh, it's, it's going to take a very long time and we may not make it. But in the meantime, there is a phenomenon that is, is curious, but it goes like this. Females are kind of hardwired to stay closer to their mother's home range. Mm -hmm. And so in, 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 in the normal world, they, they're not dispersing very far. Okay. It's the young tongs that are hardwired to get out of Dodge and get away from their sires and, mm -hmm. and move, move east. Mm -hmm. okay? If there are no females in residence, where all they go, they don't stop, essentially. Mm -hmm. So, um, the wonderful book, um, Heart of a Lion by William Salzenberg, is, is a great read on that. Yes. Looking for love is his metaphor. Um, and it's so true. So, could we augment that or make that happen better by bringing females here and releasing them so that there'd be habitat? for young toms to stick to when they get here? Possibly, but the politics of reintroducing carnivores that are so, so loved or hated is, is awkward. I personally think the following. I think that Americans should respectfully, lovingly appeal to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to rethink the whole cougar subject in this country and acknowledge that eastern forests need natural recolonization of cougars. Mm -hmm. And one way to get at that is to create a cougar recovery plan mm -hmm. for the U.S. of A, and that would feature the following kinds of things. A severe reduction in hunting pressure in the West mm -hmm. in the source population so that we could once again see that pulse of dispersers. There have been, getting back to my earlier comments about females in their tendency to stay close to home, there have been some, what I call, colonizer females. Huh. And so, but here's what happens. There's at least three of them, maybe four that I know about, and one of them was shot. Mm -hmm. Okay, you can't do that. From now on, that is so against the law, you will, you will be punished if you are caught shooting a cougar. Mm -hmm. Period. That's it. And that's, uh, so, is that the cougar, no more cougar hunting, and then are there other points? Well, if there's more? cougar hunting, it's going to really have to uh, pass the mustard for, for is it science-based, is it sustainable, is it, you know, I personally don't understand why we have to kill any predator, um, but I, you know, having said that, there are those biologists who I really respect who maintain that we have to hunt mm -hmm. a certain number of these animals. I don't know. But I think for the short term, yeah, maybe that'd be a good way to, to fix things or at least cut it way back. No harvesting of females. Um, there, should be, there should be real research, and there have been a couple biologists who have taken a look at this and done great work. There should be real research looking at what happens to the social structure of a cougar unit consisting of a resident Tom and the couple females with whom he shares his home range. And his kittens or her kittens, it turns out one biologist, Mark Elbrook, who took my course years ago, has done some stunning work with remote videos. And he's come to realize that, well, for heaven's sakes, there is such a thing as sociability in cougars. Mm -hmm. The so-called loner cougars that don't like one another, except for when they're breeding, that's not so. He has remote video footage of cougars, not even related cougars, but cougars within this social unit sharing kills. The Tom will come in and share the kill yeah. of a female. Yeah. Well, guess what? Those are his kittens. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, so there's, and I've, I've been sort of coming up with the same ideas with regards to black bears in my baby's mm -hmm. countries, which Northeast Women's Trust has helped me preserve forever. Mm -hmm. Because there's these units of, of animals that that are interacting and, yeah. and, and sharing in ways that we never knew about. It seems like that's sort of a, a, a new edge of science of the, it's only competition out there is starting to be disproven. We've seen that with trees competing. Oh, right. We've seen some more. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And I did, I put um, the name of 
the book, The Heart of a Lion, yeah. in the chat, along with uh, two other resources that Sue recommends, as well as the Keeping Track website. So all of those are in the chat um, if you just can't get enough cougars, which I'm sure is the case. Well, the, the one on the ecology of fear is really based in Africa, but it is a solidly scientific uh, analysis of what happens when you take the apex predators mm -hmm. out of the system and how the remaining pieces start falling apart. And we've seen this in ocean ecosystems when we start popping off all of our sharks and you know ocean predators, we've seen this uh, you know, worldwide. And yeah. so with African wild dogs in particular, that is a fascinating film, really excellent, I recommend it. So transferable natural laws. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, it's the new science. So. It's good stuff. So I would say the best thing we could do would be to impress upon the Fish and Wildlife Service that we need a cougar recovery plan mm -hmm. and that we need to seriously change how we do business with respect to hunting cougars. We definitely need to have it punishable if people decide to pop cougars off because that's what's happening with these phoenix. They're just being shot. They're cougars. And then would that also include things like wildlife crossings and protecting corridors and public messaging, would there be other components that yeah. you think would be high priorities for a, oh, a successful? Absolutely. Organizations like the Wildlands Network and, and your work and my work, you know, lo locally and nationally and internationally, we're looking at how can we keep together the fabric of habitat? The core and connected habitat. And that's actually a great plug for your next program. Uh, <laughs> Sue's going to be doing another program with us, uh, Keeping Track, mobilize it, has mobilized many groups of local conservationists that do that kind of backyard work of keeping cats on wildlife and using that information to get places protected. And those little nodes of local places drove up into a bigger corridor and help support regional initiatives like Northeast Wilderness Trust. And so um, later in uh, March, we'll be doing another one with Sue. Next week. Next week. Next week. Yeah. Next week. You can join us next week. <laughs> um, to that. Yeah. So that's on the Northeast Wilderness Trust website um, if you'd like to join us for that as well. Well, I think that's all the questions that we yeah, have today. That's great. Thank you so thank much. You. We really appreciate well, your time you. and your knowledge and wisdom. Yeah. It's, been a, it's been a blast. Well, thanks. Thank yeah. you very much. So